how to write a marathon training plan, what are the considerations, and how does the end product look like. In this video, I'll share with you how you can write your own marathon training plan in 4 steps, the relevant sport science, and more importantly, ways you can put these research findings into practice. This is partly because as Eric pointed out by a research paper this year, long distance training methods have often been driven by experienced coaches and athletes rather than sports scientists. So on top of sharing scientific training principles, I'll also highlight some research that will serve as guidelines for your planning. For those new to running, steps 1 to 3 of this guide will be especially relevant to you, and for those more experienced, do also check out step 4, which will make running more fun. If you're new here, this is Jinjit, founder of Allset, a personal training company, and on top of that, I also run Allwin, an exercise education platform. Let's get into it. We start off with the first step, adding long runs and easy runs into your training plan. This is because your body has three energy systems, two of which are anaerobic, which means it doesn't require oxygen to produce energy, and one of them is aerobic, meaning it utilizes oxygen to produce energy. In the marathon, you rely mostly on the aerobic energy system for fuel, and a way to develop it is to focus on it during training. Long runs and easy runs help you do just that, and to find out what your long run and easy run paces are, you can check out our previous video, 3 things all runners should know. In that video, I talk about the ways you can determine your workout paces, be it for intervals, easy run, or long run. And there are options depending on your budget, needs, and environment. Link to that video somewhere on the screen. Coming back to the topic, when it comes to adding these workouts to your training plan, start off with planning 3-5 to five easy runs each week. After that, make one of these easy runs longer than the rest. And that, in general, is how you come up the distance for your first long run. And I use the words in general because the literature is still not clear as to how much mileage you should be able to cover before attempting the marathon, how to determine the mileage for your first training week, etc. This means that, for now, if you're comfortable with running 3km multiple times each week, that will be your starting distance for your easy run. If you're more conditioned and 6km easy is not an issue at the start of your training block, then go ahead at starting with 6km. If you're unsure, it's better to err on the side of caution, especially on your first week of running. This is because you don't want to get injured, and you can always increase the mileage for subsequent weeks as you go along. Also, feel free to adjust the duration for each easy run by a km or two. This not only adds variety to your training, but also makes it easier to fit into your schedule. If you're a seasoned runner, you can also add in more easy runs. This is in accordance to a review done this year that found that workout runners do up to 11 to 14 sessions per week. But regardless of whether you're a beginner or a seasoned runner, as you get closer to the marathon, increase your mileage for both your long run and easy runs. We'll talk about staggering this mileage increase, also known as periodization, in step 2 of this guide. Because for now, the more immediate question is how much mileage should you increase each week? And the answer to that is that it varies. There are no definite formula, even in research, because it really depends on your current week's mileage, your training background, as well as how much you can handle. For example, if you're at the start of your training program, it might make sense to increase your mileage by 20% each week, especially if you already have many years of running under your belt. However, for someone relatively new to running, it might be better to increase your weekly mileage at a slower rate. Likewise, increasing 20% of your mileage in the first weeks of your training, for example, is a much smaller jump as compared to later in the training plan where the numbers are larger. So it doesn't make sense to fix on a certain percentage or a number. It's also why if you have past training experience or running coach, make sure you utilize them to come up with your training plan. They will be able to guide you in terms of how much load you can handle for this season as you progress. In the scenario you are totally clueless, a useful tip is the hard cap of 30%. This is according to a study in 2015 which found that novice runners who progress their running distance by more than 30% over a 2-week period seem to be more vulnerable to distance-related injuries than runners who increase their running distance by less than 10%. Apart from that, the other thing to take note is how much weekly volume is required for marathon training. And to that point, there are few references. A paper in 2020 states that for a fast marathon finish time, a higher training volume of at least 40 km per week seems important. However, it does not seem necessary to include an endurance run of more than 35 km. To put this in context, the other paper studying elite runners found that typically weekly running volume in the mid-preparation period is around 160 to 220 km for marathon runners, and it's common for them to cover more than 35 km for their longest training run. It goes to show how much your training can differ depending on your running ability. If you're an average runner looking for a more useful reference, perhaps another meta-analysis done in 2020 will be of help. He found that an individual seeking to achieve a time of 4 hours for the marathon will need to complete on average 44km or 4.5 hours of running per week to achieve this time. Their weekly training distance over the entire training block should peak at 63km and the longest training run associated with a 4 hour timing was 23km. He goes on to say that the results of our analysis will suggest that individuals who achieve 4 hours in a marathon do not need to complete a run 32km in length during their training. Based on this, it's safe to say you do not need to complete a marathon to train for the marathon unless you are looking to compete at the elite level where there are plenty of athletes who complete a 42km training run before the race itself. Likewise, there are athletes who do two long runs each week. More about this in step 4 of our guide where we also talk about different ways you can do your long run. If you are a beginner, however, the takeaway here is that if you are aiming just to complete a marathon comfortably, there's no need to do a long run beyond 32km and even one in a 20 plus km region might suffice. That brings us to the end of step 1, and right now, your training plan should minimally contain your first training week which includes long runs and easy runs. Next up, we have step 2, where we discuss the number of weeks the training plan should cover, what is periodization, and ways you can do it. I also talk about cutting down training volume before race day, also known as tapering. 
To start things off, you need to determine the duration of your training plan. And if we reference how professionals train, one training cycle for the marathon will take five to six months, with the period divided into general preparation and specific preparation. This is as stated in the review starting World Class Runners published this year. Across the five to six months, the focus gradually shifts from achieving high total running volume to achieving more running volume at or near race pace. Each athlete's progression is either based on extending his or her accumulated session duration at a goal pace, or establishing high intensity volume and then slowly increasing pace. However, not everyone trains like professionals, and a common duration coaches and athletes dedicate for marathon training is 16 weeks. This is partly because not everyone has the mental readiness to last through five to six months of training for a marathon. And if you are not experienced enough, you might feel burned out by the fifth month of training and dreading a marathon when it arrives. Hence, a way to go about things is to start with a 16 week period before lengthening your training period to five to six months for future races if you want to get more serious about marathon training. Use this tip to determine how long your training plan should be, and once you have decided, the next thing to focus on is periodization. This starts with adding deload weeks, where the training load is reduced for the body to recover, as well as absorb the benefits of training. And as you get more advanced in designing a marathon training plan, your periodization will also include changes in training focus too. For example, we previously mentioned elite athlete's progression of either extending his or her accumulated session duration at a goal pace, or establishing high intensity volume and then slowly increasing pace. More about how we do this in step 4, where we talk about training intensity. For now, I just want to clarify that the load weeks, also known as down week and cutback weeks, are commonly carried out by coaches and runners throughout the world. However, there's no clear signs as to the best way to go about them yet, and hence, it's again one of those things that's based on coaches and athletes' judgments. If there's any literature update on this topic, I'll probably post on our YouTube video, but if you want the most up-to-date exercise science, do check out our education platform, Orvin. We now move on to the last thing in this step, tapering, which simply means the reduction of total training load prior to important competitions. As pointed out in the review of world-class athletes training published this year, this is a short-term balancing act because you want to decrease the cumulative effects of fatigue while maintaining fitness. To be more specific, it goes on to say that the general scientific guidelines for effective tapering in endurance sports include a 2-3 to three week period with 40-60% to 60 reduction in training volume, adopting a progressive, non-linear format while training intensity and frequency are maintained. Of note, another recent study in 2021 backed this up. It found that discipline tapers were associated with comparable performance benefits. The research also highlighted how most recreational runners adopt less disciplined tapers and suggest that shifting to a more disciplined taper strategy could improve performance. In simple terms, the takeaway here is not to increase training intensity or volume during your taper, no matter how tempting it might be, across the two or three weeks. At the end of step two, you should have a training plan consisting of at least 16 weeks of long runs and easy runs, your target weekly distances, with periodization and tapering factored in. The next step, step three, is adding a strength conditioning plan. And this is partly because as stated in the review this year, the evidence robustly shows that lower limb resistance exercise is effective for improving running economy and performance, with a combination of strength and plyometric training being recommended. At the same time, strength training is often encouraged for injury prevention, although the same review concluded that lower limb resistance exercise may reduce running related injury risk, but further evidence is needed. This is partly because there has been research whereby strength training has helped with injury prevention and also those where they do not. I discussed all this as well as how to write your own strength conditioning plan in a previous video, and I'll put a link to that video somewhere on the screen if you're interested. At the same time, I'm also coming up with more useful content on strength training for runners, so if you're interested, feel free to hit the subscribe button. Once again, part of this is because I do personal training and online coaching for a living, so feel free to reach out if you're already overwhelmed. Otherwise, that's all for step 3. After you have checked out our strength training for runners video, your plan should at least include 16 weeks of long runs, easy runs, strength exercises with deloading and tapering factored in. For most beginners, this should be good enough not only to help you complete a marathon comfortably, but also understand your plan in a straightforward manner. With that, we come to step 4, customizing faster workouts. This is because for those looking for their personal best or those who find it too boring just doing long runs and easy runs, it becomes essential to aim other types of workouts. To start off, I'm going to reference the intensity zones defined in a recent review of World Class Runners. This is developed after considering different ways to categorize the intensity levels, including rate of perceived exertion that goes from a scale of 1 to 10, grouping your heart rate into 5 or 6 zones, etc. A thing of note is that although researchers ultimately split the workout intensity into a 3 zone and 7 zone model, you realize that categorizing intensity zones differently doesn't matter as much as the research findings. This is because zoning is an interpretation of the actual intensity, and once you know the training rationale, you know which intensity to run at, regardless of which zoning model you use. In this guide, I'm using the researchers' zoning model simply because we are referencing their findings. The first of which is that most of the running distance, specifically more than 80%, is done at low intensity throughout the training year. Most of this is in zone 1, and the rest is in zone 2. To be exact, a higher proportion of zone 2, which is closer to marathon pace, is done during the specific proportion period. The remaining 5-15% of running distance is split between zone 3, zone 4, and sometimes zone 5, depending on how far away the marathon is. To quote the review, 
Most training in zones 4 to 5 are done in the early to mid preparation period before they are replaced with zone 3 and upper end of zone 2 training as marathon approaches. Training in zone 5 and 6 is usually avoided by most marathoners and lastly, less than 1% of the annual running volume is spent during sprint training which is in zone 7. On the whole, in simpler terms, what the review found was that elite runners did their faster workouts during the earlier parts of their training. For example, the second and third month of a six-month plan, and then there's more brace space running as the marathon gets nearer. Taking all this into consideration, you might want to start off with looking at the training plan you already have on steps 1 to 3 of this guide. From there, switch out 5 to 15% of the running distance to faster workouts. When it's 4 months out from the marathon, this can be your real 2 max intervals and your heel repetitions, and as you get closer to the marathon, this can be your threshold intervals and threshold runs. Once again, what your exact sets really are depends on you and your coach's judgments because there isn't a most effective formula yet. And the advice is that you start off with what you're comfortable with. That's all I have for now. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comment section below or reach out to me. Contact details are in the description. Otherwise, till next time, take care.